Okay, welcome back, everybody. Thanks again for being here, the transitioning to L&D conference. Um, if you've made it through the entire week, I pretty much figure you have gotten a lot of your questions answered about learning and development, how to proceed through with and find some success. Maybe even find out that this is not the place for you. You want to do something different and that is absolutely great too. So um, ultimately, I hope that you enjoyed the event and um, and that you'll continue to look for TLDC events in the future. Um, I'm always programming them and building them out. So um, look for that in our newsletter and all that good stuff. So we're ending the event now with Lainey Istvan, who is um, a former teacher, 15 years, taught K through eight, English as a second, wait, English, Wait, ELA, what does that stand for again, Lainey? Yeah, English Language Arts. English Language Arts and History. Um, left the classroom in September 2020 and have since worked higher ed, corporate, and now is a full-time freelancer. Um, we're going to be t talking about the language of ID, commonly used industry and business terms in the field of instructional design. This is um, a session that a lot of folks have been waiting for, just that getting more comfortable with that terminology and all that. So, um, Lainey, thank you so much for doing this one. Thanks for closing out the event. I'm just going to hide myself from the stage and let you take it away. Okay. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Luis, for that introduction. And um, I'm so pleased to be closing out the session. And um, thank you to everyone who's here today because <laughs> it's Friday, a very long week. And um, it's 5 p.m. here in Florida, and not, not to mention it's a, a holiday weekend. So um, if you're here, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So we're going to be talking about the language of instructional design and words and terminology that are frequently used in our field. And just to give you a little bit about me, I am uh, Lainey Istvan. My pronouns are she, her. And um, I'm a former teacher, just like Louise said. And um, I spent 15 years in the classroom before I was a teacher. I actually was in the field of sales and marketing. I sold um, internet advertising before the, the burst of the dot-com bubble. Um, I worked in radio. I had a really great opportunity to write scripts and do some creative writing before I went into teaching. So um, wanted to be a teacher. Then I had a professor who was like, mm, I think you would do well with um, creative writing um, and marketing. So, you know, it was impressionable I, and I listened. And um, so I did that first. And, it, you know, it was a great experience. I learned a lot about the corporate world and I learned that, that I'm creative as well. So, um, but, you know, I wanted to start a family and um, kind of figured like sales wasn't for me. So I went back to school to teach and come to find out I had a couple friends in the classroom and they said, you know, you don't need a, a teaching degree. You can alternatively certify. And I was like, no, you can't do that. And they were like, yes, you can. So I had already had a few classes under my belt and I just, that's what I did. And I went and I went to the classroom. So I started off as a kindergarten teacher. I taught kindergarten for five years, and then I kind of just went all the way up. I started having kids, so I felt like I was mom at home and mom at school. So I just started going up, 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 and I finished my career teaching seventh grade civics and um, a ton of different certifications. I kind of moved around. I went to like a few different schools. Um, but I, when I was ready to move on, I um, found instructional design, was looking to go back to school, didn't want to do ed leadership because I had a lot of people that I knew who left the classroom, went into ed leadership, and they just like forgot everything about what it was like to be in the classroom. And I said, you know what, that's not for me. That's not what I want to do. So I... Um, met with someone from St. Leo University and she told me about instructional design. I'm like, that sounds amazing. I want to do that. So that's what I ended up uh, going back to school for. And then I was, uh, I taught through the pandemic and then uh, I left the first September of 2020. 
So I've had a couple full-time jobs and I've worked in higher ed and corporate. Now I'm a full-time freelancer and I also do business development for ID Lance. And um, I'm a mom of two, um, my wife to a cop. I am a Friends fan, love Friends. And um, I'm a little woo. <laughs> I like my crystals. Um, I love learning about astrology and the zodiac and, um, you know, manifestation and things like that. So if you like to talk about that too, look me up. <laughs> and my favorite color is purple. And just one comment about my cat. Sometimes they'll just jump up and think they own my desk. So I apologize if they show up. I'm also in Tampa, which is the lightning capital of North America. So uh, hopefully, you know, it's a little storm going on right now. So hopefully I won't lose my Wi-Fi. But if I do, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to just start by saying that we don't know what we don't know. And um, you know what? Before I say that, um, let me just show the poll here. Just wanted to get a, a picture. If you haven't answered already, how far along are you in your ID journey? So in the process of transitioning, recently transitioned, or transitioned six plus months ago. Wow. Okay. So. 82% is in the process of transitioning. That's so exciting. Well, I'm so glad you're here, and I really hope that um, you get a lot out of my presentation today. And um, we'll get started. All right. So we don't know what we don't know. And I love this graph because when we come into something new, we know a little bit about it. And then we know that there's things that we don't know, but then there's just a whole bunch of things that we don't even know. <laughs> we don't know. So, and when we enter into a new field, you know, we have the culture, lingo, speech patterns, and just ways of communicating for our job, what we do. But within that job, then we have a department or a function of the company that also has their own culture and their own ways of speaking and doing things. And then inside that, the organization itself, the company itself also has their own culture and speech patterns and language and ways of doing things. And then even bigger than that is the industry that we're in. So for example, um, I worked for an insurance firm and that was totally new to me. I really didn't know anything about insurance to be honest with you. So I had to learn, you know, I knew about instructional design, but I had to apply that to my organization and then the industry as a whole. So I was learning all kinds of new stuff. And I'm still learning. So what I wanna say is, don't be afraid to ask questions because I really don't think that anyone will expect you to have all the answers. No one will expect you to know anything. And it's just like when you know we started in the field of teaching, there were tons of acronyms and just um, legal terms and um, legal acts and things like that, that that we had to learn. So it's kind of like starting all over, but it's also exciting. So don't be afraid to ask if there's something you don't know. I wanted to share this because I, I love this graph because when we start something, you know, we're like super confident about it. And it, and it reminds me about my teenagers where they just, I have a, a, a ninth grader and an 11th grader and they just know everything <laughs> and I know nothing. So, um, you know, they know everything about everything. But as we um, become more competent in our field and we spend more time in it, we kind of realize, oh my gosh, wow, like there's more to this than I really expected. Um, and so it kind of takes a little dip, but eventually, you know, you gain more confidence, you gain more competence, you understand, you know, you have more of the language and, and more of the skills, and then your confidence goes back up. 
And then I'm also throwing this in here, the forgetting curve. Sometimes you'll hear this referenced. And I think it's just something good to remember that, you know, if something doesn't stick in our memory, a couple days later, we're going to lose it. So just something to keep in mind as we, as you learn new things and as you design for your, for your learners that, um, you know, there has to be that, that follow up or some type of practice so that it moves from short term memory into long term memory. So we'll talk about um, a few instructional design models and theories. I won't go into too much depth, but I think that these are important because they do come up in interview questions. I've had a lot of interviews myself and I've had this question quite a few times. They might ask me, what, um, what instructional design theory do you feel is most important? And so, and, and why? <laughs> so, um, you know, having a good working knowledge about them is important. Even if you haven't necessarily applied them, still knowing and um, understanding their purpose and what, what they do. So we have the ADDIE model, and ADDIE is more like a framework. It's not a theory. It just provides you with structure on how to complete the instructional design process. And this one is called the waterfall method because you complete one, you go to the next. You complete one, you go to the next. And you start at you know, the, the analyze um, step, and you just go all the way down to evaluate. And the other type is an iterative model where it's repetitive. And so it's where as the waterfall might be more linear, this one is going to be nonlinear. And you kind of move back and forth between the steps as you know you, you talk to the stakeholders, you maybe try something, it didn't work, and you just go back and forth between the steps of the process. And both ways are good, both ways have their um, their time and place. Another one I want to touch on is the SAM model, which um, it's it's the successive approximation model, and this was I believe created by Dr. Michael Allen and Dr. Richard Seitz. And um, incidentally, Dr. Richard Seitz was my boss in my first um, instructional design job. So man, I learned a lot from him. He was um, a really great um, leader and I learned so much. So um, the SAM model is another iterative um, instructional design you know, framework where you go through the different phases, but you can always go back. So if you come to the um, iterative development phase and something doesn't work, you can come back to the prototype and the design and the review. And it's very much encouraged with the SAM model to be iterative. That's like the key to that model. Okay, some theories now. We have the cognitive load theory, which um, you know, just basically says that the human brain can only remember and, and focus on so many things at one time before it starts interfering with the learning process. And, you know, I like to think about like if I'm reading or if I'm doing too many things and learning too many things at one time, it's like I hit a wall. Like I just, I can't learn anymore. Like I need to step back and take a couple days and process what I've learned. And that's um, what the cognitive load theory is about. So Myers 12 Principles of Multimedia Learning is, uh, and you might have seen this on LinkedIn, I've seen, um, you know, different ones of this floating around, but it's basically, it helps with the cognitive load, um, especially when it comes to multimedia learning experiences and just ways to like organize um, content on the screen or, you know, not to include, you know, sounds at the same time as like lots of text, um, things like that. So that's a good one to look up. And then we have Gagne's nine events, which these are more like steps that the learner, like how to put them in the right mental state to learn something. And there's nine of them. And, you know, starts all the way with gaining attention, 
and then you know telling them what they're going to learn activating like their their prior knowledge and then just all the way through to the the transfer assessment transfer so it's a really good one to kind of step you all the way through what a good learning experience should look like and this is very similar to the classroom And then a couple other ones, social learning, you know, especially when you're in a higher education position, you know, you'll find maybe like discussion boards or things like that where people have to collaborate. And so, you know, this is a good one for them to learn from each other. And then andragogy, which is a theory by Malcolm Knowles, is all based on adult learning theory and how adults learn differently than um, children because adults are based on like their needs and their goals and you know, what they're trying to achieve in their professional life. And it's also based on their motivation. They're motivated to learn, usually, <laughs> unless it's compliance training. And then um, the last one is Merrill's principles, which reminds me of, like, the gradual release method um, where, you know, you show them I do, we do, you do, and scaffolding. All right, so next is the instructional design process, words and terminology. So my, my goal is not to overwhelm you. I just kept thinking of more words and more words. <laughs> and um, But I, I, I really tried to select the ones that I think were, were really important to know. And, you know, I'm not saying that um, that you have to be like super master of all these words and you know you have to like spit them out um, during interviews but they are words that you will come across and um, you'll have heard it before and you're like oh yeah that's right I know that so we'll start with a gap analysis which is a needs assessment and so you're looking at you know what what are where are the learners right now what's their current state and then what, what's the desire to be? Like, what do we want them to do when, um, when they finish the learning experience? I'm going to see if I can check the chat here. OK. All right, so um, gap analysis. The second one is task analysis. And I do believe that Kara North had touched on this one in her presentation. And that's observing and understanding how users complete their tasks. So if there's a change in procedure or there's onboarding and you need to you know, teach them, you know, look at someone who's an expert user or someone who does their performs their job very well and you need to teach someone else, it'd be great to talk to them. An intake. Um, discussions slash call. In my position at the insurance firm, we that's what we called it. And we had an intake form as well. So any internal clients that wanted the L&D department to develop some training, they had to fill out this intake form. And after they fill out the form, then we had the discussion. So that's really just about the project. Let's talk about like, why are you requesting training? In a nice way, you know, but like, why are you requesting training? And you know, what's, what's possibly going on that we can help you solve? A discovery call is very similar to an intake discussion, but it's like business to business. So for example, in my role as a business development um, manager, I speak with pr prospective clients and we have a discovery call like, um, all right, so you've, you've contacted us, um, you think you need some training, let's talk about it. Like, what, what are you experiencing? What's, what's, hap what's not happening that needs to happen? Or you already have training, it's not going so well. Like, what, let's talk about that. And then how can we help you as a business? So that's more like a discovery call. And then of course, learning needs, you know, just we're often talking about either onboarding training, changing a behavior at work, changing a like workflow or process, and compliance. There and there's probably more, um, but these are the ones that I thought of. And then personas are really good, especially when you're trying to design with empathy and using a hum human-centered design approach, and just keeping that learner at the center 
of the learning experience, which that makes sense, right? Because the learning experience is, is for them. Um, of course, you want to achieve the business goals along with that, but keeping the learner at the forefront and creating a fictional profile that you can keep in your mind as this, this person that you're designing for, that's a persona. And subject matter expert, SME. You will hear <laughs> the term SME thrown around all the time. And um, poor SMEs, they get a bad rap, you know, but really, they really are the expert and they're just so passionate about their topic. And I feel like our role as instructional designers is to, they have the creative vision, right? Like they, they see it, but they can't make it happen. And so our job is to collaborate with them and to make that happen. So you can see it as a, a partnership. Um, that's a good way to look at it. Okay, so with development, now we are taking what we've planned, what we've brainstormed, and now we're putting it into action. So now these are words that you might come across in the development phase. Now I just wanna say, there's probably a lot of words that I missed. So um, any of my um, colleagues in the chat, if you would, yes, Sean, I will definitely share this for sure. But um, for any, any colleagues, if you have things that you want to add, absolutely, please add it. Because um, this is definitely not a comprehensive list. Just things that I've come across in my experience in the last couple years. So we have modules, we have units, we have lessons. I feel like I've heard these terms be used interchangeab interchangeably, but each organization kind of has their way of using them. You know, sometimes they call them units, sometimes they call them modules. Lessons go within the unit or they go within the module. So it really just is going to depend on the language that, that your LNG team uses. Chunking content is another phrase that you will hear, and it really helps with cognitive load. So when we're taking um, a huge PowerPoint presentation that is like, <laughs> it's all text and it's like, oh my gosh, um, you wanna break it down into little bite-sized pieces so that the learner is not overwhelmed and they can absorb and learn the content. That's chunking. And then micro-learning is, it's, a, it's a, a training that is small in time. So it's like two to five minutes, no more than 10 minutes because then it's not micro, um, but it's really just designed to be efficient and effective in a short period of time. And then of course, nano learning is something that's come around as well. And that's like super quick bits of training content. And I like to think TikTok and even YouTube shorts I've seen. Um, as ways to deliver nano learning. And then a drip campaign is something that would be delivered over time. It can actually be the, um, the course content itself, or it could be the person's already taken their, their training and you deliver like ways for them to remember over time. So, you know, it could be, you know, it could be uh, SMS, it could be texting, it could be email, it could be chat. So that's just another term you might hear. All right, we also have learner engagement. We talk about that a lot. That's, you know, how do we keep the learner engaged? And, you know, that's a big topic of conversation. And basically what that means is that it's the psychological investment in learning. And I'm sure that there are times that you've taken a course and you're like, whoa, that, where did the time go? That was amazing. And then there were times that you were like, okay, when is this over? <laughs> um, so, you know, learner engagement is really important because that's where they're going to take that information and translate it, you know, and, and use it, which is what we want. We also have levels of e-learning development. And so I believe there's four levels. So level one, two, three, four. And level one would be like just a, kind of like a clicking, you know, very minimal interactions. You know, you might have some knowledge checks. 
And then as you move up the levels, you move further into complicated interactions. You we're talking about like drag and drop. We're talking about um, custom interactions that someone, um, they might have to do something at, at their job, you know, and it might be very like hands-on type of job. And then you create something in storyline, for example, that would be like highly interactive and gamification, like goes all the way up to level four. So if anyone ever talks about, well, what level is this? That might be what they're talking about. And we have gamify and gamification. So gamify is just using some elements of gaming, where as gamification is applying game mechanics to a learning experience. And long form versus short form. If you're a writer, you're like, OK. <laughs> but for me, this was a word, a couple words that I came across. So you, know, you have like 2,000 words, maybe, versus 1,000. A learning object, don't really hear that one too much, but I did come across it in higher ed. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of my professors, she used that, um, that term a lot. And it's just basically a reusable digital or non-digital resource that um, you can maybe use in one course and then use it in another course. They, you know, it might apply to both um, courses. And then uh, MOOC, again, not really one that comes across too often, but it's an open online course. You know, if you've ever taken a, a course that um, is free, that might be a MOOC. And legacy content, I think I might have put that in another part of, of the presentation here, but that's basically like unstructured content that the organization has. And sometimes it's even in someone's brain. It's not anything that's, that's written down yet. Um, when I worked at the insurance firm, that was one of the um, main projects that they had wanted me to work on, was that there was a lot of knowledge that people had in their brain because they were used to just training like in person, and they wanted to get that information down into a physical course. So we used the, took the legacy content and documented it. So when we talk about the implementation and evaluation, we're talking about now the executing, executing the, the training experience, the learning experience, the course. And we have alpha, beta, gold. These are just different versions. Like when you first complete a course, you have the, the alpha. You know, and that goes out and like people test it out and they come to you and they're like, this doesn't work. You know, there's uh, maybe typos or spelling errors. Um, so it's definitely not, it's not the version that's, that's the final one that's going to go out to the learners. And then beta is like the second, it's, it's a lot better and kind of fix those things. And then, you know, you're just minor things you're um, fixing. And then the gold version is like, hopefully done. <laughs> it's the final is the final version. All right, ILT, instructor-led training, and the ILT is virtual instructor-led training. And sometimes we have a hybrid, which is a combination of both. And um, I think the pandemic really kind of opened people's eyes to you know, the hybrid type of learning, you know, where we have synchronous at the same time or asynchronous where it can be done anytime, the learning, the learning experience can be done anytime. And virtual producer is something that I hadn't heard of, honestly, you know, before I became an instructional designer. But it's basically the person behind the scenes while there is a virtual um, instructor led training going on. And they kind of like manage everything behind the scenes because it really is very hard to be the instructor and like manage, you know, the chat. And if people are having problems, like I, I can't get in, I can't get in the training or, you know, my Zoom isn't working. It's just near impossible. So having a virtual producer is a huge help.
I'm just checking the chat. <laughs> All right, a few more. We have the LMS, which is the learning management system. And this is software that houses, delivers, and tracks the content. And there are so many LMSs out there that I didn't even realize how many, how many there were. But, um, you know, they all have different, they all kind of do the same thing, but they have different capabilities. Let's just say that. And I can't tell you everything because, well, I haven't seen all of them. <laughs> but um, yeah, they're, they're important because it keeps track of people who've taken the course and it provides like an opportunity to follow up with them. Um, I know in one company I worked at, if people didn't take their training, especially compliance, because in the insurance industry, there was a lot of compliance training that that had to be taken sometimes once a year or something in the industry changed and they had to you know take another compliance course and so we would follow up with them and say hey reminder you haven't taken this course and if you don't take this course you know we're out of compliance so you have to take it the lms can do all that an lms migration is moving so if someone if a company wants to leave their old lms and they want to have a new one they have to migrate all of their content from the old one to the new one and it's not it's not just the content it's also the people and the data and the information so i personally haven't worked on an lms migration i've kind of been like to the side of a migration and like hearing um, all the discussions and the meetings. And from what I gather, it can be complicated and that should say time consuming, <laughs> not time consumer. <laughs> um, but yes, it can be a headache. So next is SCORM and I just use the, I just call it a SCORM. Like I had to look up what the full, <laughs> all the words in SCORM are. So it's shareable content object reference model. I'm not gonna remember that, but it's a SCORM. And um, so they're, they're units of content that can be shared across platforms and systems, as long as those systems are SCORM compliant. So it's basically just a file that can be read by any system that can read SCORM file. So as long as the um, LMS is SCORM compliant, you can upload the file to anyone um, as long as it's a SCORM file. <clears throat> we have XAPI and TinCan. Well, TinCan, I believe, is the same thing as XAPI. I'm no expert. <laughs> I just know that you can track more user information and more data about you know where the learner goes the things that they click on how much time they've spent on a particular activity did they abandon this activity all of those things can be tracked with x api but you need a learning record store in order to collect that that data which is the next term here and it just so it basically enables the system to store and retrieve that data. That's pretty much my extent of knowledge <laughs> about XAPI. But, you know, important to know. And then in the evaluation process, we have four levels. Reaction, this is Kirkpatrick's um, four levels, and reaction, learning, behavior, and results. So reaction is just basically what it sounds like, the learner's reaction. How did you like this course? Did you find that it was helpful? You know, sometimes you might have seen like at the end of a course, a smiley face or a sad face or like, you know, a meth face. That is the reaction, the level one of evaluation. And then um, the learning level two is, well, what did you actually learn from this? That could be like the summative um, assessment piece of the, the learning experience and then behavior did now after you've taken this course how did that translate 
to you on the job? Did, did that help you, you know, make those behavior changes or, or do those new, um, those new ways of doing things that, that we wanted you to do? And then the last one, results, is um, return on investment for the company and the money, you know, basically that they had the budget that they put toward that development, was it worth it? And I would say, unfortunately, that's not really um, the evaluation piece often gets overlooked, you know, in favor of speed and like moving on to the next project. So, you know, I say just try, you know, whatever you can try to, to do in your organization is helpful. So you want to make sure that your learning is being well received also. Okay. I have like 10 minutes left. I got to show you guys something. Anybody remember this, <laughs> this uh, timer? If you are an uh, ESE teacher or um, some, some states call it SPED, um, it's, a, it's a timer to help kids you know, visualize how much time they have left. So yeah, I love it. Just a few terms here. I didn't want to go, you know, too crazy. But um, something important to know is a brand style guide. This often comes from the marketing team. And this document details the company standards for writing, editing, formatting, and designing. So we're talking like colors, we're talking fonts, we're talking um, maybe headings. A lot of times they can be a PowerPoint and they have a specific PowerPoint, you know, that you have to use whenever you're creating for the organization. So um, branding and, and style is pretty important to keep a consistent look across the organization. Otherwise, you know, multiple people designing, it could look just like it came from anywhere. So to keep it consistent, we have the style guide. And we also have uh, a word that's iconography, and that's just icons and symbols that are part of the brand that is used consistently and that means something to the organization. We have assets. And assets are basically, you know, I have this visual down here. These are all assets. So they are things that um, a company, maybe, what might be a good word, a company, the, the course, the learning experience, and their images, videos, design files, um, interactions, learning objects. If you work in Storyline, if you work in Rise, you can put Storyline blocks. You know, those, those can be assets too. And UX UI is user experience and user interface. And those are used to um, by people in that department to make sure that the experiences that the learners have are meaningful and that they're intuitive and, you know, it's easy to use. I don't have much experience in that area, but I know what it is. <laughs> And uh, multimedia is using more than one medium together, like graphics and animations, or text and narration, and it could be more. And then intros and outros and bumpers. Some, one, one job I had, we used the term bumpers, and then when I used that term in another full-time job I had, they were like, bumpers, what's bumpers? <laughs> but the difference was, there was a multimedia team in the one job I had, and then in the other job I had, there was no multimedia team. So you know, you just never know until you until you get until you get there and you experience what it's like to work there. Um, you just never know who's what language is going to be used. Project management. I just like this graphic. I thought it did a good job of um, just kind of giving an, just an overall picture of what project management does. Yeah, um, they help set goals, they plan, they mitigate risk, 
they control you know the process teamwork they keep costs down communicate and they help problem solve and the project project managers are so amazing because they really just they're they're very task focused and they just keep everyone on track. And so you know, maybe some people might be like, oh, the project manager, you know, is gonna ask me, you know, where I'm at with this project. But but really that's a good thing because in organizations, um, you know, time is money, right? They always say that. And their main goal is to make money for the business. So as instructional designers, we could potentially work on a project forever, right? Like we could keep tinkering with it and making it better and, you know, but that's not realistic in the real world. And so the project manager helps keep things on track. And so a couple terms to go with this is a kickoff meeting. And that's where people get to know each other, get to know the team. They set expectations. They talk about review cycles. They talk about meetings and they kind of set all of, like set the expectations up from the beginning so that the whole project just works like a well-oiled machine. Savvy Start is there because that's what it's called in the SAM process. Well, there's a little more to it, but it's basic, it's kind of the same thing. And then a touch base meeting is weekly meetings that update all stakeholders about the project's um, progress. Not necessarily a review meeting, but it's just a touch base. And then review cycles are can be done, uh, you know, like in a meeting, but more often it's like, we're sending you the project, we're giving you some time to look at it, maybe it's a week, maybe it's two weeks, and then you send it back to us with your revisions, and then we update them. That's a review cycle. PM's project manager, QA, QC, quality assurance, quality control. This role is very important too, because, um, you know, Sometimes when we're working on a project, we become blind to it. And I can't tell you how many times like I've sent something to be reviewed and it's got a typo in it. And I'm mortified <laughs> because you know that's I really like to think that I pay close attention. But when you're not looking at those things and you're working on something for a really long time, it happens. You, you miss those things. So that's why QA is so important. Um, and scope. Scope is basically the project, like what's what's going into this project? What are the factors? What's the work that needs to be done? Like, you know, maybe what are the milestones um, with this project? And then scope creep is something that happens when mm, maybe there's too many revisions or maybe the expectations aren't being managed and it's changes to the scope that can really like be potentially de detrimental to the project. It can cost money, it can cost time, it can cost resources. So scope creep is a bad word in <laughs> instructional design. We don't like scope creep. All right, just a couple things to show you for project management that you might come across. Um, Agile is uh, just a methodology, really, that breaks work down into small increments. Again, it can be waterfall. That word is cut off, waterfall, but it could also be iterative. And then Kanban is another way. It's kind of, kind of like a Trello board where, you know, it just all of the things that you're working on and you just move them across as you complete them. We have sprints, which again is another iterative process and it gives um, teams time to complete their work and say what, you know, just do what they say they're gonna do and then have that deliverable ready. So the sprints that I've been a part of are usually two weeks, but from what I've read, it can be up to a month. And then we also like to, to use this term, you know, the iron, iron triangle. You can have it good and fast, but you can't have it cheap. You can have it fast and cheap, but you can't have it good. <laughs> so um, it's just kind of one of those things to, you know, keep in the back of your mind that you can't, this doesn't exist. You can't have it good, fast, and cheap. Doesn't work. Okay, I'm gonna try and squeeze this in because I think that these are important as well. These are general business terms that, again, I have come across in, in the last few years 
that I didn't know. So I want to pass that along to you. So business acumen is like a blend of your knowledge and your skills and how you can understand the business and how you can effectively apply yourself in the business and, you know, be successful, right? And, and help the business find success too. A sell is a statement of work. Now, believe it or not, I actually did hear this term in my first full-time job and I was like, what is that? <laughs> and I was too shy. I didn't ask, but I looked it up and it's, and it's a statement of work. And it basically, a proposal is where you send someone and say, hey, I, I can do this work for you and here's what my rate is. Whereas a statement of work is more like a contract and it outlines all of the deliverables and all of the, the work. Um, and of course, the agreed upon rate that the work will be done. Business model, we have B2B, B2C, um, business to business or business to consumer, and there's more, but those are the most common. Heuristics, I heard used a lot. Those are just mental shortcuts and you know ways of doing things quicker and better and faster. Business vertical is a specific industry or niche. You know, like, um, I don't even know, like organic, Milk, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's a niche industry. And then sales enablement is providing the sales team with content and tools so that they can sell more effectively. We have business margins, which measure profitability. Leadership development is the training specifically designed. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I'm almost done. It's training specifically designed for leaders within the organization. And R&D is research and development. And, you know, it's just further researching for your business market and always just staying on top of it. Like what, are, what are the, you know, latest needs and wants and desires of your customers? We have change management, dealing with changes in the organization. And, and there are actually roles, like specific job roles in change management also. I'm showing you the disk. I, I, this is just DISC. This is not Kohl's or Myers-Briggs. And I'm not saying that I agree with it, but I am saying that a lot of organizations still use it. So just be prepared. I'm not sure that it's a, or an argument you want to tackle, but um, just be prepared. You know, a lot of one organization I worked at, you know, everyone was a D and I and S or a C. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it is what it is. All right, fiscal calendar versus calendar. So fiscal is the financial for like accounting purposes, doesn't always align with the calendar year. It's not always January through December. Sometimes, you know, it's February through January. So something to know. And strategy, corporate strategy is company vision. We have the strategy for the business and the functional, functional strategy is more practical decisions. Ethos is a company's distinguishing practices and values, kind of like their culture. That's you know, kind of like what what they're founded upon, like their foundational principles. And of course, um, I know that Matt Bosnick talked a lot about culture and how we do things. And you know, each organization is different, each department is different, and the industry is different too. Almost done, I promise. Silos is a term that we use when we describe um, IDs who work alone with mu without much collaboration. You probably heard this before. You know, we work in silos or we don't work in silos. Um, you know, every organization is kind of different how they choose to, um, you know, I guess collaborate or not collaborate. It just depends on your, your organization. KPIs are key performance indicators, and they are a quantifiable measure of performance that is set forth by the company. We have return on investment, ROI, customer success versus customer service. Customer success is like being proactive to um, keeping a good relationship with customers and, and value. And then customer service is more reactive. And then client facing is, um, it's basically directly interacting with a client. So if you ever do contract work or freelance work, 
is in my experience, a lot of clients will say, well, I really would like to work with an ID who has client facing experience. Um, so that's something that comes up a lot. All right, and cross-functional teams are, this would be like a functional team. Oops, sorry about that. This would be a functional team. This would be a cross-functional team. So it's just basically a team that's made up of different members from, from um, each of those functional departments. All right, we talked about legacy content, stopgap, so temporary solution, and manage up. Just wanted to mention this because it was something that I had never heard of before. Um, I had a mentor in my first role who happened to be like, uh, he was a project manager. He was like the VP of project management. And I really learned a lot from him. And the one thing that I learned was manage up. And so basically what that means is cultivating and creating a proactive relationship with your leader and coming to them and telling, you know, letting them know um, the things that you're doing, um, what you're experiencing in the organization, and also how you can help them, how you can help them do their job better. And it's kind of like a win-win situation because you create value for them, you create value for yourself, and you create value for the organization. And one of the questions he asked me was, where do I see myself in one, three and five years. And I honestly didn't know how to answer that question because I was like, I don't know. I'm an instructional designer now. <laughs> like, what, what do I do? So that was kind of um, eye opening for me in the sense that, you know, if you want to grow with an organization, then those are definitely things to think about and managing up can help you achieve that. So that is all for me. And so again, I thank you for sticking with me. I know it's um, you know, Friday afternoon and everyone's probably ready to get onto the weekend. So please connect with me. You can find me on LinkedIn. That's my email, my website. I'm gonna be honest with you, I do have an Instagram and I check it, but I don't post very much. Um and um, the introverted ID, you know, was when I first became an instructional designer. I'm like, I'm introverted, I'm an ID. And I realized that probably many, many, many instructional designers are IDs. So anyway, connect with me. I would love to chat with you. Wow, Lainey. I did not expect this one. Um, oh. <laughs> have you done this one before? This presentation? Yeah. No. Oh man, you got to keep this one ready. Um, this is a good oh, one. Thank you. thank you so much. <laughs> uh, let me <laughs> see if there are any questions. Okay, yeah, you, you answered the to Sean that this one would be shared. Yes, how would you like me to share that, Elise? Would you like me to just email it to you or? Yeah, could you? I'm getting a little echo, so I'm not sure what that is. Um, sure. I'm going to double check and make sure that it's on the line end. Yeah, no, I'm good. <clears throat> um, well, ultimately, great, Lainey. This is a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Louise. I appreciate it. And thank you for putting on this wonderful event. It's been so beautiful and um, just so, you know, the instructional design community is just so helpful and kind. And um, and I haven't watched everything yet. I've watched a few, but I am looking forward to going back and checking everything out. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was good. Everyone was good. Every it, session every was great. Time. It was crazy. But um, I'm going to send out a survey. Yeah, I'm going to send out a survey after everything wraps up because I want to find out if the schedule worked. And then I can't promise that we'll do something like this again anytime soon, but you know, we do have the DEI event that I'm going to start planning soon. And um, who knows? I'm not sure if that needs to be a week, but I'll talk to, uh, to my pals like um, Kayleen and Cindy and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we come up with. Yeah, definitely. All right. And thank um, Parker and Andrea for me again, you know, really know. thankful to have, um, 
ID Lance as a sponsor once again. So um appreciate that. It's our pleasure. Yeah. We love okay, everybody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up. Everyone have uh, hopefully you're gonna have a nice weekend. I know I'm gonna have a three-day weekend on my end. My mother-in-law is on her way now to spend the weekend with us. So <laughs> time to get the house cleaned up. And um, and so uh, have a good one. Um, we'll see you next time. And don't forget, if you're not already subscribed to the newsletter, just go to thetldc.com. Subscribe there. Um, everyone that's registered to the event, I'm going to send you res the resources and stuff um, at some point next week. I just got to get all the recordings formatted. Um, and that's it. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.